Hello. Hey, you're back. Back. Let me guess, you have a gun you want to sell. You're right. <laughs> Rob's a gun guy. He comes in the shop a lot, and he always has some sort of interesting firearm to sell. All right, what do we got this time? What I've got is a Savage Navy, 36 caliber. OK. Um, Savage Navy. That is one ugly gun. No, that's not an ugly gun, Rick. That's a Navy gun, and it's pretty to me. This is because it has something to do with the damn Navy. That'll work. <laughs> I came to the pawn shop today to try to sell my Savage Navy revolver from the Civil War. It's extremely unusual design. I keep coming back here because, hey, they keep buying my guns. What am I to do? Yeah, this is really cool. I've never actually seen one of these things in person. I've never even had one in the store. They started making these in, like, 1862, 1861, yes, somewhere around there? Yes, they are making them right in the height of the war. As long as they could make it different, they could make it and sell it, and the government would buy it, because the government would buy any gun at this point. Well, like any entrepreneur, if there's money to be made, they found a way to make it. Yeah. And that's the gun that resulted. So basically, cock it with your middle finger, and then fire it with your index finger. The thought was that was a good mechanism, because you could fire them a little quicker. I really don't see the advantage. More of a pain in the ass than it's worth. I mean, it's, it's heavy, it's awkward feeling, it just wants to tilt down. One of the goofiest designs. That's why I love it. These two fools don't know what they're talking about. Anything to do with the US Navy is high class. So I'm assuming you want to sell this like the rest of them? That's what I'm looking to do, that's right. I don't know how important this screw is right here. There's just too much, too many questions I have about this thing. Let me call someone in, let them look at it, um, and get an idea what I can pay for it. Okay? That's, that's all right. You bet. All right, I'll be right back. You bet. I can understand him bringing in an expert. He doesn't know how much I know and how much of mine is just smoke, so he needs to bring someone in to make sure he knows what he's getting. This is what I would call a proto-double action. It's one of the first uh, double action revolvers, and the concept was that you could shoot a lot more quickly. In reality, not so much. The gun was very complex, so there was plenty of room for mechanical error and failure. Not very popular. They sold about 11,000 out of the 20,000 made to the government. The rest went to the civilian market. Why? Because the gun sucked. <laughs> so this is civilian. It's definitely not a uh, government-issued weapon. The interesting follow-on, though, is that the civilians often transported them south, uh, and they became used by the Confederacy as well. And for that reason, it's a neat collectible. The Savage Navy is an interesting firearm because it's a technology that, while it led to the double-action revolver, the idea did not work very well. It looks all there. I mean, um, there isn't any major damage to it besides the finish more or less being gone. There's a screw missing on the bottom. Uh, yep, you're right. I know what your next question is. Yeah, how much is it worth? Yeah. Um, you know, the good news is it's not restored in any way, shape, or form. Uh, you know, usually when you get a gun that's in this type of condition, someone will have made an attempt to restore it. You know, it's going to be a civilian model, and that's going to be the primary driving force behind its price. Of course, condition being the other driving force. So okay. I would say uh, in its condition, as it sits, the gun's probably worth retail. $1,800 to $2,000. OK. Thanks, man. Thank you. Take care. A bad idea means they don't make very many, and that's one of the ingredients for something being very collectible. If you've got a Civil War collection, you have to have one of these guns. $800, Rick. Uh, no, no, that's not going to happen. No, I'm thinking more like $1,250, though. I really am. Uh, what, uh, you know, I was hoping to get about 1800 for the gun, OK? Yeah, well, that's I think what that's we want to get out of. I, I think you'll do a little better. They're really hard to find. I, I know they're a hard gun to find, but they sit around a long time. It's a weird gun, so. 1650 uh, I'll go 1300 bucks. 1575 I'll go 1300 bucks. 1550 1300 bucks. I, I mean, I can't do it, 1300 Sure you can. No, I can't. 14 and a half. That's really the best I can do. I'll go 1350. 1400 and I'll do that. And we'll shake hands and I'll walk away and you know I'm going to come back with some more cool stuff. Yeah, I'll do 1400. All right. I'll do 1400. Touchdown. Okay. You Thanks. got to us again. Now that I got $1400, I'm just going to find another gun and do it all over again. Hey, how can I help you? Right, good afternoon. A cavalry sword. Civil uh, War officer sword. Model 1860. Belonged to uh, Colonel Bassett. This is pretty cool. 
It was pretty cool. <laughs> I'm selling a model 1860 officer Civil War sword. I found the sword up around Yosemite. The sword is in beat up condition considering it went through 22 battles. I'm selling the sword because my wife wanted a new kitchen and my wife should get what she wants. What's his name again? Bassett. OK. Do you know much about this? Colonel Bassett came into the uh, Civil War as a captain into the 17th Regiment one of the most highly decorated officers, because he went in as captain, came out as a brave general, went through 22 skirmishes and battles, and was there at least surrender. There's no other sword that's seen as much battle as this sword has seen. OK. And my problem is I've never heard of this colonel that was breveted to a general. I just, I've never heard of him. No, nope. yeah. but they should have made a movie about this guy. OK. I mean, this is my big problem. You see these right here? Oh, yes. Those things in it, OK? Those are sword fighting marks. Sword fighting didn't happen in the Civil War. You know, it was guns and bayonets, OK? Rarely it ever happened. And when you see dings like this, almost inevitably, it's always from kids who found the swords and started sword fighting. I beg to differ. Um, 22 battles is going to put some marks on a sword. It was broken in battle. Even though I haven't heard of this Bassett guy, doesn't mean he wasn't an important general during the Civil War. We had millions of people fighting in the Civil War, so I can't know about all of them. One of the big problems with this sword is the condition. It's broken. What do you want to do with this? I'm going to sell it. And how much do you want for it? 20 grand. 20 grand. You want to have someone look at this? No, I would actually welcome it. All right, I will be right back. Um, hang out. OK. It is always nice to have an expert look at it. I'm excited to listen to what he has to say. It's uh, history, and that's what excites me, is to uh, relive the history of what these guys went through during the Civil War. This is the sword of the colonel that he says was later a general. OK, this and, is and the Colonel Bassett that you called me yes, about? Yes, that, oh, that is the guy, nice. Colonel Bassett. Um, I've never heard of him. The, the, you know, one of the things about the Civil War is there are, there are so many men involved that a lot of officers sort of drop off the radar. You know, you hear about the real big name ones, and you hear the ones that got some kind of really cool name, Stonewall Jackson or something like that. Isaac Bassett, there, there's no cool name there, but he was well enough thought of as a commander. OK. I'm curious, what is your concern about it? it? It is obviously a Civil War sword. No, I mean, it, it's got his list of his battles right here. Oh, it's really? got some engraved, okay. it's got his name engraved on it. It would have been extremely unusual for Bassett to have this done. You didn't engrave your own sword. Correct. People would give them to you. Given that this is Colonel Bassett, and it's ending it with Gettysburg, that makes sense. Because he made Colonel in May of 1863. Gettysburg is July of 1863. So this was probably given to him as a presentation piece. Everything fits, everything's right. And this is an absolutely original Civil War presentation sword. And you don't normally find those. OK. I mean, he's saying that it's this was broken off in battle, and I don't think there's any way to prove that. No. Because if this was done from something hitting it, you would see some sign of, of bending. It looks to me like it's just a snap. My guess is if something like this had actually been broken in battle, there'd be a record of it. He would have made sure of that. OK. You gave me all the information I need and more. <laughs> <laughs> I always try. <laughs> You're the best, man. Good to see you. Very good to meet Thank you. you. Thank very you. Much. Unfortunately, the sword is in terrible condition because if it was in good shape, you'd have people lining up around the block that would want this. All right. Uh, I'll tell you right now, if this thing was in beautiful condition, I'd offer you $10,000 for it because you have a Civil War general sword. But it's just, the break in it just detracts so much. In this shape, I'll offer you 2,500. Well, I'm just going to, I'll have to 
decline that. Okay. I mean, what's your best price? Yeah, we're too far apart. I completely understand. But um, thanks for bringing it in, man. I really appreciate it. I very it. much appreciate you looking at it. Okay. The expert brought up two or three facts that I was totally unaware of. I think I'm going to continue coming up with some more research, and then I'll probably put it back up for sale. So earlier, a guy came in with a percussion revolving pistol. It looks like something that was probably built during the Civil War as an army contract, maybe. But I'm just shooting from the hip there. I have no idea. So I've called in Alex, because he'll actually know what he's talking about. <laughs> These are cool. I know absolutely nothing about this. <laughs> It's Civil War-ish. It's a pretty good guess. Yeah, okay. it is Civil War-ish. It's a Savage and North figure eight revolver. This is the model 1856, so it's pre-Civil War. Savage and North were based in Middletown, Connecticut. They did make revolvers for the Union Army and the Navy, and this was an attempt to create a rapid-fire revolver. It just looks like a terrible design to me. Well, it was radical for its time. It has a ring trigger here. When you pull the ring trigger back, it cocks it, and then the upper trigger will actually fire it. So you can, and you get a much faster rate of fire as you do that. And especially if you were on horseback, you wanted to be able to use one hand to fire it, not two, because the other had to hold onto the horse. Yeah. <laughs> so here's the thing. There were so many variations of this type. This is actually the very first model second variation. So what is the difference in the variation? So the very first model, they only made 10 of, and those are rare as hen's oh, teeth. Wow. The second variation, this one, which was really just used for testing, they made less than 250. So the serial numbers for these are always on the grip frame. So to find that, I've got to take off the grip. Is that all right? Yeah, if you got the right tools. Sure. If it doesn't have it, it's going to impact the price and not in a good way. Okay, so right here, you can see there's a serial number and it looks like it's 29. So that's a good thing. That means it's the 29th first model, second variation they ever made. So overall, it's a really nice, rare gun. It's definitely desirable. How much are you asking for it? I was thinking around 10,000. Frankly, that's a little on the high end. Okay. It's certainly a valuable pistol. The one thing that I think, if you're really considering purchasing this, that we should do is to try to fire it. And the reason I say that is the collector's market for this is very strong just for what it is. However, if it can function and function properly, I think the range is not far off from what you were asking, depending on how it performs. Want we'll to go to the shooting range? Just down the street. Let's do it. Yeah. OK. Um, well, you want to put it back together? I will put it back together. <laughs> <laughs> I've never shot the gun. I'm glad that we're going to go shoot it and see what it's worth. I set up a little shooting gallery. We got six bottles. All right. So the revolver has six rounds to fire in rapid succession. So who's going to shoot it? Uh, I think I'll shoot it. OK, because I'm not. OK, I <laughs> yeah. figured that. So these pistols can be really finicky. If it fails, it will still be a value, it just won't be as high a value. Well, let's hope it shoots. Yeah. Okay, well, let's load this thing up. If you're gonna own a gun, even an antique gun, it's nice to know that it actually works and it's not just a wall hanger. This one is marked number 29. So that means it's the 29th one made. It's in the first 10% about. It's a really good sign for collectability. And if it fires well, it's definitely gonna be worth more than if it doesn't. Now it's getting real. <laughs> <laughs> we look to be ready. So full cock, and here we go. <laughs> nice. That's one. Three. That's indexing OK. Four. Five. One yeah. more. Five out of six. It worked hey. really well. The sixth guy would have probably killed you. Yes. But, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wasn't too far away either, so. Uh, yeah. All right, so um, it works. Yeah. I, I would say um, it performed really well. You have a really fine example of an extremely rare pistol, an early serial number. So the top of the market for these, I know you wanted 10 grand, right. but 7,500 is, is really, I think, the limit. And I think this gets there. All right, well, thanks, man. All right. All right. Really nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. Okay. <laughs>
So, um, what do you want? How about seven? No, how about four? Four. Five. Four. It's a really cool gun. Eventually, I will get that number, but sure. it will take a while. It is a very limited number of customers out there looking for this. Yeah. If it was a Colt, I'd pay you more. It'd sell quicker. Sure. I'll tell you what, I'll give you 4,100 bucks. 4,100 today? Today. Today. All right. Yep. Okay. Yeah. 4,100. Right. Let's do it. All right. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. So here, you take this. Okay. You take it back to the pawn shop. Okay. I will gather up the mess. And uh, I'll be Perfect. down there in a half hour. Perfect. Okay? Thank you. All right. It's not the 10000 I was asking for, but you know what? I'm going to take this $4,100 and go get me a new truck. Hey, how can I help you? I have some Civil War cannonballs. Really interesting. Have you ever fired one like that? I got a cannon that shoots bowling balls. <laughs> I came down to the pawn shop to try to sell my Civil War cannonballs. I'd like to get $100 a piece for them, but I'll take as low as 50 Where did you find these? My father tore down a jail, and these leftover Civil War cannonballs were in between the slabs. OK. These type of cannonballs were not like you see in the movies where the cannonball comes down and it explodes and everything. What would happen was a good artilleryman would want to shoot it straight, so when it hit the ground, it bounced. The, the idea was shoot it, get it bouncing against the ground, take out 5, 10, 15 troops, because a leg with bone and flesh isn't going to slow this thing down a bit. Pretty heavy for a little ball. This right here, a packet of 10 or 15 of these was crammed down a barrel. You get 15 or 20 of these things bouncing across the battlefield, there's going to be carnage. So it's possible these have been used in a battle and hurt or killed someone. You said that they were used in the building of a, of a jail. Of a jail. They were probably surplus. Mm. It's really hard with cannonballs to date them, because basically that's all they are, is a round piece of iron. Um, they've been making them the same since the 1400s. Before that, they just made them out of stone. So could they be older? Um, these definitely look Civil War-ish. Really standardized balls. Okay. Uh, cast well and everything. But this thing right here, I think this is older than the Civil War. Um, it's more crudely made. Uh, Revolutionary War? Something like that. That's yeah. pretty cool, too. It's impossible to be 100% sure that these are authentic. But I don't think anyone would take the trouble to fake these. They're not worth a ton of money, but there's a huge market for anything from the Civil War. So I think I can get them sold. How much you want for them? 50 bucks a piece. OK. Um, first off, these are pretty damn common. Farmers still find these today. A Little less common, but remember, they made millions and millions of these. How about 100 bucks for the lot? What about that one that's older? You know, it's still just an old iron cannonball. How about 120, then? Um, um, yeah, what the hell? I'll give you 120 bucks for it. All right, thanks. You want to write them up, Chubb? I'm going to practice juggling. <laughs> I sold the balls for 120. I was hoping for a little more, but I can live with that. Hey, how you doing, man? Uh, I was cleaning out some boxes uh, from storage and out of the garage. And I found this, and I uh, think it has some considerable value to it, uh, because it appears to be a billfold with uh, Confederate money in it. Okay. And it has a date on it of uh, 1857. Hey, Pops, come take a look at these. What you got, son? Some money you used to spend. <laughs> <laughs> I was going through some boxes in my grandparents, and I opened it up, and there it was. And I thought, huh, I'm hoping it's real Confederate money. I mean, it looks real. Um, and inside the wallet, it's stamped 1857. So uh, I'd like to come have them check it out and see what the value is of it. Think those are real? Um, yeah, these are real. They got a border on one side. The other side, they don't. Right. It's the reason why they cut them with a pair of scissors when they cut them apart. They cut every, every bill by hand. Yeah. There's... Back then, they didn't have machines like they have now. Yeah. Every, there, it was just the dawn of the industrial age. You could see the edges were, were uh, misaligned, and they were straight cuts. Uh, 
cut too much to one side, cut not enough on the other. I was very impressed with that. I can't believe that someone actually hand cut the bills back then. It's amazing. This wasn't actually money. It was a promise to pay you money because up until basically the 1930s, money was gold and pieces of paper were promises to give you gold. Okay. Okay. And that's why if you read these, it'll actually say right here, two years after a treaty of, okay. It says right here, two years after a treaty of peace. Of, okay. Fine. Would you like for me to get my glasses for Just you? Just shut up. I can do it. Okay. It says two years after a ratification of a treaty of peace between the Confederate States and the United States of America, which basically meant that they would give you $10 two years after the war was over. I got gotcha. you. The assumption was after the war was over, you know, two years after the war, right. you'd be able to trade them in for gold coin. But towards the end of the war, it would cost you like $1,000 for a bar of soap. <laughs> in any event, they're worth, they're worth something. They are worth something. So what were you looking to get out of them? Uh, honestly, from the research that I've done, I'm, I'm thinking somewhere 1000 1500 bucks as a package. Okay, um, that's not going to happen. Problem is, they're breaking apart. They're falling apart. The paper they printed on, it's, it's a type of rice paper. Mm -hmm. And it just, as it got older, it got brittle and starts falling apart. But pulled up to the light, can you see the holes? Staple gun? No, because it's dried out and it's falling apart. Huh. Um, Basically, I can give you like 150 bucks for them. I mean, in this shape, I'm gonna sell them for like 30 bucks a piece, and it's gonna take me a year or two to sell them. 800. I just can't do it. It's not here, man. I mean, I'll go 200 bucks on it. 800. I'll go 200 bucks on it. I mean, that, that's the problem. I mean, if they were in beautiful shape, I'd do it. I just hate to give this away for 200 bucks. The collectible market has fell apart like a $2 watch. <laughs> okay? And at most, I'm gonna get $600 out of them. All right, so 600, that's not bad. So why don't we do 300 and you double your money? All right, 300 bucks, man, you got a deal. All right. Okay, thanks. and I'll even give you the wallet back. Serious? Yeah, serious. All right. Worked out really good, I thought it was fantastic. I walked in with about $150 of Confederate money, walked out with 300 American dollars, I doubled my money. Hey, what can I help you with? I've got a Civil War drum. Okay. Uh, I've been in the family since I was a kid. Why did you need a band in the Civil War? <laughs> I came down to the pawn shop today because I've got a Civil War drum that I'd really like to sell. It doesn't have too much sentimental value to it, so that's why we decided to sell it. Well, I'd like to get maybe 2,000 for it. So where did you get this thing? A good family friend of ours who collected Civil War, you know, antiques, she gave it to us as a, as a gift. You know, seeing that it's 13 stars, I figured it was pretty old. Why is there only 13 stars? This is like the idealistic flag, 13 stars from the Revolutionary War where we had 13 colonies. They've been putting it on stuff ever since. It's just symbolic. You would still put on something today. During the Civil War, believe it or not, they usually just had kids carry the drums. Wow. They would actually play these things going into battle. And uh, the reason they'd have a kid playing it is because you could have an older guy use a rifle with a bayonet a lot better. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be that kid, man. During the Civil War, a lot of kids enlisted in the Army as musicians so they could follow their dads and older brothers into battle. By some estimates, the Union Army had over 100,000 soldiers under the age of 15. It's made from 10. Um, you see the wearing right here? Mm -hmm. That was probably rubbing from like leaning against someone's body, hanging out someone's body. Did you put the silicone glue on there? Don't know how that happened. Obviously, at one point, this was loosening up, and someone decided to fix it. Anyway, besides that, it's in wonderful shape. Um, you have this, all this inlay in the wood. You have this tin work. And things like that from the Civil War are pretty damn rare, and they're pretty expensive. I'm always interested in Civil War stuff. There's just so many diehard collectors out there that I can sell to and turn a profit. And if this drum was actually used in battle during the Civil War, that makes it super valuable. Okay, I got some concerns. I, I think it's a little too fancy to be military. The military is more utilitarian, and this doesn't look that utilitarian. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, this looks, this looks like the real deal, though. Okay, I would like someone to take a look at this thing. Let me call a buddy of mine. We'll get this thing figured out. Okay. I'll be right, right back. You bet. A legit Civil War drum has got all kinds of potential buyers, from Civil War buffs to guys who collect antique musical instruments. I really hope it checks out. So what do we have? Um, apparently, we have a really old drum. And I figured if anybody would know anything about it, it would be another old drum. <laughs>
The guys normally call me down when they have an artifact that they want a little bit more information about. One of the interesting things about snare drums, and this would have been a snare drum. You'd have a, a head on one side that was just the, the normal skin, and on the underside of it, you would have the snares running across, and you use those to add to the sound. Because the, the whole point of the drums was you had to have those in order to communicate on the battlefield, in order to communicate while you were marching. The drummer would have a special cadence to play, and then you knew, okay, that was my group, I'm supposed to charge now, or I'm supposed to retreat. You needed some kind of way to signal your troops. So what you're trying to do is sneak attack on somebody, Mark? You don't use the drum. You just tell them to go. Oh. The role of the drummer in the Civil War was similar to many wars before that. You needed a way of communicating before radios. What are your concerns on that? OK, um, I just want to know, is it a military drum, and is it from the Civil War era? Because it just looked really ornamental for a military drum. Interestingly, in the Civil War, a lot of the drums used were quite fancy. They would normally have an eagle on them or a flag on them. They would be painted. These were used to an extreme extent during the war. But as I look at this, I don't think this one is Civil War. I think what you have is a very nice early parade drum. The Civil War drums never did this kind of press work into the wood. This is a later 19th century style of decoration. The size is unusual uh, for the Civil War period. It would have been a deeper drum at that time. But it's still a, a wonderful example of a late 19th century drum. Thanks for coming in, Mark. Not You're a problem. The best. Thank you. Well, I'm really disappointed. I really believed it was uh, from the Civil War, uh, but apparently it's not. It still seems like it's a valuable piece. Um, yeah, there, there's still money here. So how much are we looking to get out of it? How about 2,000? Um, you don't have 2,000 bucks here. I will give you like 400 bucks, though. Four? But it's a real drum. It was, you know, it's the I, real, I, I real know deal. it's a real drum, but if it was Civil War, it's a military collectible. Civil War nuts will buy it and everything. We have more of a decorative piece. That's the difference. How about eight? I'll give you 450. Mm, tell you what, I'll settle for five, but I can't go any lower than that. You know what? I think I can make money at five. OK. All right, Good. 500 Good bucks. All right. Write them up, Jim. All right, okay. get you over there. Even though it's not from the Civil War, I'm pretty satisfied, you know, with what I'm getting for it. So I, I can handle 500. What can I help you with, man? I have a flask. Not just any flask. This one opens up at the bottom. There's a, a note in here. You have a message in a bottle. Yes, I do. <laughs> awesome. I decided to come to the pawn shop today to sell my Civil War flask. I was cleaning out my grandfather's basement. He passed away, and then came across it in a box, and I saw the note in it, and then I figured, you know, it was worth something. I just lost my job, need the money. Figured a couple hundred bucks would help me out. When did you write the note? <laughs> me? <laughs> I didn't write that. Yeah, right. OK, it says, silver whiskey flask carried by David Alexander Shepard, 1823 to 1883, before, during, and after the Civil War, in which he was entrusted with the funds of two Confederate banks with instructions to stay out of the way of the Yankees. Well, there's a whole little story along with him. I mean, the neat thing was, I mean, if you were a spy or something like that, I mean, unless someone looked at this thing really closely, they wouldn't have noticed. This flask is awesome. It's definitely silver and very high quality. It's the type of item that wouldn't sit around long on the shelves of my store. I'm interested, because the only thing better than making money is making money fast. Smells like stagnant water in there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You can just tell by the hallmarks it's old. Those are English hallmarks. And it says D.A. Shepard right across the front of it. The great thing is it's in beautiful shape. So what do you want to do? You want to pawn it or sell it? I want to sell it. OK. And how much do you want for it? I don't know. What do you, I don't know what it's something like this is I for. mean, this thing is from the 1850s or the 1840s. All right. About 800. 
Um, it's not too far off. I was thinking more in the neighborhood of 500. Six fifty, have a deal. I'll tell you what, I'll do six hundred bucks. I, I think it's a fair price. All right. Okay. Six hundred bucks. All right, Chump, can you go write them up? Sure. I'm psyched to get this flask. You can tell by the way it's made, it's definitely old. But I keep thinking about that note, and if there's any way to validate the story, I can probably get a few hundred more bucks for it. So I'm gonna call on my buddy and see if he can authenticate it for me. This is what I called you about. Nice little flask. Not full. That's unfortunate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My name's Mark. I'm the administrator of the Clark County Museum System. I've been in the museum field for over 30 years, so there's not much out there I haven't seen at one time or another. It's a 19th century silver flask. I know it's sterling silver, but there's a little note in it saying it's from the Civil War. Um, I know that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> that's right. I was just wondering with the name on it and when it was made and everything, if yeah. we actually could tie it to the Civil War somehow. All righty. It's inside? Mm-hmm. Ah, there it is. Great note. Oh, silver whiskey flask carried by David Alexander Shepard I, 1823 to 1883. Before, during, and after the Civil War in which he was entrusted with the funds of two Confederate banks with instructions to stay out of the way of the Yankees. <laughs> and if this were not possible, to shoot his way out of a corner with a pair of Damascus steel target pistols. I know, it sounds like something out of a book, doesn't it? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a pretty good plot line. But, uh, you know, my guess is that, you know, while it's a, it's a wonderful story without any further documentation, I'd go with what you can tell that it is. It's a high-end flask, you know, about 1840s, very well done, all hand engraved. It is silver, and it really is in beautiful condition. You know, to have one that is in this kind of condition is wonderful. Normally they're banged up. The only ding I can see is this one on the bottom of the uh, cup portion here. So, so that's what the bottom was for? Yeah, yeah, that was just a cup. You could drink out of that. Oh, okay, I thought it was like some sort of hidden compartment or something. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can pour it into there. Okay. Have a wee nip and, and go on about your way. <laughs> so I think you did just fine. This is a beautiful piece. Well, thanks a lot, Mark. I appreciate it. Not a problem. It. I'll fill it up and we can use it next time you're in. There we go. <laughs> thanks. Have fun. I'm kind of disappointed we couldn't validate the story. But the good news is the flask is real. It's in incredible shape and I should have no problem doubling my money on this thing and selling it quickly.